Can depressed doctors get emotional help without license repercussions? Is it even possible for physicians to get confidential mental health care? I just got this email from a physician. Hi, Pamela. Wondering if I could curbside you on the topic of seeking mental health services as a physician. I'm not suicidal or impaired, but considering consultation with a psychiatrist for meds, any chance you'd be able to chat with me a short bit for tips to avoid stigma and labeling? Most medical professionals fear seeking help due to diagnoses that can follow a physician for a lifetime. I'm Dr. Pamela Weibel, and I run a suicide helpline for physicians, so I've got a unique vantage point. I've spoken to thousands of med students and doctors with anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. In fact, doctors seeking help may suffer lack of confidentiality, board punishment, and license repercussions. Punishing physicians for occupationally induced or exacerbated mental health conditions is cruel and all too common in medicine. Physicians have trouble asking for help. By the time the doctors ask for help, they're often in dire straits. By punishing the most vulnerable at their greatest moment of need, we increase the already high suicide rate for doctors. Even worse, when boards are involved, our private pain may be viewed publicly in perpetuity, as one doc explains. Do you know what really hurts? The fact that anyone can look me up on the internet and read my dirty laundry. I'm publicly shamed, punished for being ill. I will only know peace when I am gone. So how can we prevent suicides if we punish doctors who need help? How can medical professionals be assured their private suffering isn't shared publicly? My best advice comes from more than a decade of hearing worst-case scenarios from med students and physicians who have faced persecution when seeking help. I've gleaned best workarounds and navigation strategies from victims and their psychiatrists, many now adept at protecting physician patients. Here are 13 tips for depressed doctors who need confidential mental health care. Number one, avoid care through your educational institution. HIPAA's privacy rule does not apply to treatment records at educational institutions under FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. I know trainees sent to school psychiatrists who breach their perceived confidentiality by sharing medical charts with deans and program directors. FERPA health records are HIPAA exempt and courts have ruled students have no private right of action for a FERPA violation. Number two, beware of mandatory physician health program referrals. Forced mental health care by an employer or board is never the best way to get confidential psychological support. Many medical institutions fund PHPs, a financial conflict of interest. Plus, PHPs charge high fees not covered by health insurance, leaving some docs in financial ruin after seeking help. Number three, bypass employee assistance programs. If you suffer work-related mental health problems, seeking help from an employer-funded counselor presents a conflict of interest, kind of like going to your rapist's house for counseling, and risks a confidentiality breach. A surgical resident shares, I struggled with lack of sleep in a program which eventually was put on probation for duty hour violations, though we were bullied into lying about our hours. Any violations were our fault, not the program's. I was picked on by a more advanced resident, and the PD sent me to EAP because he thought I was the problem. They sent me to a psychologist who diagnosed me with ADD. He sent me to a psychiatrist who added bupropion and methylphenidate to my escitalopram. I ended up not having my contract renewed in the end. Number four, confirm your sessions are confidential. Ask if all your communication will be 100% confidential. Inquire about exceptions. Health professionals are mandatory reporters legally bound by state law to report abuse. Plus, HIPAA allows them to breach your confidentiality if you're a threat to yourself or others. Number five, confirm that your private records are stored securely. Physicians' personal medical records have been accessed to discredit them and discriminate against them for disability insurance, licensing, hospital privileges, and medical liability cases, and may be dragged into court during divorce. Publicizing private medical records online is a form of extreme bullying by boards. To protect physicians, some health professionals use biometric fingerprint safes to store handwritten paper charts with fake names. Psychiatrists may hospitalize docs and VIPs like high-profile athletes and celebrities under fake names in fake charts, never stored with other records or in EHRs. An emergency doc reveals, I was sued. Overwhelmed with grief and fear, I took antidepressants and saw a psychiatrist. I paid cash and considered using a false name. I had already seen the board send a physician to six weeks of inpatient alcohol treatment due to a complaint without any proof he was drinking. That saved his license, but he owed an astronomical bill.
Number six, don't have your mental health records inside an EHR. From hackers and government agencies to prying eyes of peers, you are forever at risk of a privacy breach with electronic health records, one doc wrote. Psychiatry has been weaponized against physicians, with libelous entries placed into the EHR by psychiatry sucking up to admin after a physician reported misconduct and patient safety issues at that hospital. The EHR becomes a battleground for a false narrative against you. If you complain to the board or any other agency, first thing they'll do is read your personal EHR which is now ruined, falsely stating psychiatric diagnoses or substance abuse you don't have. Reputational harm can be severe and could cost you lots to defend yourself before a board, including hiring forensic psychiatrists to testify that you're not nuts. Number seven, don't use your insurance. To keep the medical regulatory complex out of your private life, it's best to avoid having psychiatric billing codes attached to you. A mental illness may be used against you by the board. In a malpractice case, even be grounds for denial of disability and life insurance policies and could screw you over big time in a divorce or custody battle. One psychiatrist reports, I deal with these issues all too often. Appalling that a patient should be afraid to utilize their expensive personal insurance to pay for mental health or be unable to fully divulge the extent of their suffering to allow me to best help. Number eight, go virtual or go out of town. Docs in small towns don't want to sit in a psychiatrist's waiting room next to their own patients. Physicians don't want to be locked up on inpatient psych at their own hospital. To get confidential care, many choose telemedicine or go out of town. A dear friend shares, after reading an article about one woman's journey through hell after being honest on those board application questions, I sought care an hour away. I drove an hour in another direction to nervously fill prescriptions for antidepressants. I required several meds to stop thinking of suicide all day, every day. My suicidal thoughts were 100% work-related. Number nine, consider pharmaceutical confidentiality. To avoid picking up psych meds at the local pharmacy, docs fill scripts out of town. Boards can access state pharmacy records, so some docs use Canadian mail-order pharmacies to avoid U.S. persecution. Here's one physician's workaround. I used samples of Paxil. Had my spouse write me prescriptions for Lexapro, Boost Bar, and sleeping pills over the years. I didn't trust other doctors. I didn't want any of this stuff in my records, and I didn't want to be seen as crazy. This is how many doctors refer to psych patients. Number 10, be familiar with your state board rules, statutes, and applications. Most board applications ask invasive mental health questions, then threaten to pull your license for lying. A physician shares, applications also ask about gaps in education, training, or employment. Essentially, they're fishing for more information. Responses like leave of absence to get treatment for a chronic medical condition will be met with requests for medical records or other information. So even if you get Ask these first questions. Applications are designed so you'll have to disclose one way or the other. Then, in tiny font print before the signature line or in associated hidden documents, you'll be waiving your HIPAA rights. The submission of an application to the board shall constitute and operate as an authorization by the applicant to each physician or healthcare practitioner whom the applicant has consulted or seen for diagnosis or treatment as a waiver by the applicant of any privilege or right of confidentiality. Physicians are terrified to lose their livelihood, even if their job is killing them. One doc reports, I've been in practice 20 years and have been on antidepressants and anxiolytics for all that time. I drive 300 miles to seek care and always pay cash. I am forced to lie on my state relicensing every year. There is no way in hell I would ever disclose this to the board. They are not our friends. What happens when you declare your mental illness to the medical board? Two doctors share their experiences. I was definitely subjected to discrimination, and it comes up every time I apply for a new job, license, or malpractice. All I had was run-of-the-mill outpatient-managed depression, and I probably should have chosen to just lie about it like 95% of applicants must. But I didn't, and almost 20 years later, it's still hanging over my head.
By checking the yes box, have you ever been treated for depression, I was required to sign a five-year consent agreement with stringent quarterly regimen. Each quarter, the following had to be submitted to the state board. Evaluation letters from multiple colleagues to affirm my fitness for practice and appropriate interactions with staff and patients. Scheduled meetings with an assigned psychiatrist for validation of my fitness for practice and a meeting with a board subcommittee, all completed prior to that month's board meeting, all because I did not hide having been depressed and was, and still am, taking an antidepressant. I've always wondered what would have happened if I just lied and said I've never been depressed. Of course, even if you lie, the board has the power to subpoena your medical records. Curious where your state board stands on mental health issues? Read my peer-reviewed article that ranks each state, Physician-Friendly States for Mental Health, a review of medical boards. Number 11, review hospital privilege and insurance applications. Many hospitals ask the same invasive mental health questions. Check wording on applications for hospital staff, insurance credentialing, disability, and life insurance. I've seen good friends denied disability and life insurance policies tiered to same as one-pack-per-day smokers because of history of depression, even while controlled with meds. Coercive and unnecessary referrals to PHPs. Sometimes boards take away the physician's freedom, dignity, even license. Agencies and some boards don't differentiate between illness and impairment. They apply policies of ADA and HIPAA differently to physicians in the name of protecting the public safety. Licensing agencies and corporate medicine can mandate release of information without any sign of impairment. Our physician ER colleague had to fight 10 years for her license due to disclosing feeling the baby blues at work. Discrimination should not and does not only apply to a few listed categories of race and gender. Discrimination due to one's profession is also a type of discrimination that is not addressed when it comes to physician rights. Number 12, beware of sharing your mental health with colleagues, especially market competitors. Sadly, physicians are encouraged to rat out each other by med boards and hospitals, as this woman explains. The only time my physician fiancé got into trouble with the boards of both Texas and Ohio was from a co-worker. This other doctor believes that anybody and everybody who is medicated for mental illness is an immediate danger to his patients. So when he overheard my fiancé talking about being on antidepressants, chronic depression since 18 years old due to abuse and childhood, a fact he always spoke openly about during college residency and career, he reported him to the Ohio board. They put him on probation for five years, even though he never made a major mistake. Then the Texas board heard about it. He didn't have the money or time to run off to Texas for the hearing, so he voluntarily relinquished his Texas license. That blackballed him with Medicaid and several pharmacies. No wonder doctors are killing themselves. Number 13, consider curated confidential peer support. Often the most impactful first-line intervention for depressed doctors is peer support. Not with coworkers or competitors, but with an intimate group of up to 10 docs who meet regularly to heal together from suicidal thoughts, childhood or residency abuse, isolation, divorce, business problems, and more. No paper trail, nothing to subpoena. I've been curating physician peer support groups every Sunday for nearly 10 years. A suicidal surgeon shared, spending two hours with you all was more helpful than any therapist I've seen, anything they did on inpatient psych, any help I've gotten yet. No matter what, always seek the care you need. Your life is precious. Despite the physician mental health witch hunt, Always choose your health first, no matter what the career repercussions, as this physician shares. Since being hospitalized with severe suicidal depression, I have lost my privileges, malpractice insurance, a current malpractice case now wishes to settle instead of defend my care. Patient died of a blood transfusion reaction, not negligence on my part. My specialty society is failing to let me sit for MOC, and these events are all reported to the board, so I will face an investigation soon. 
breaks my heart that as a society and community of physicians, we do not extend the same care and concern that we extend our own patients. I tried so hard to handle my own mood disorder without the help I desperately needed because of the repercussions I knew I'd face. Going to the hospital was the very best thing I've ever done for myself. I'm facing a total loss of my career and livelihood. But I can now handle it and stay alive. So back to you, the physician who wrote me tonight for a curbside consult on tips to avoid stigma and labeling when consulting a psychiatrist for meds. You wanted to chat with me. I called you twice this evening, got no answer. So I texted you. Since I couldn't reach you and wouldn't have been able to summarize all my advice in a quick call, I wrote this article just for you. Bottom line. You're unlikely to be guaranteed 100% confidentiality unless you see a psychiatrist who keeps locked in safe paper charts with a fake name and claims no idea who you are if subpoenaed by the board. You'll need to always pay cash, get meds filled at an out-of-state or out-of-country pharmacy. You'll need to keep your mental health completely separate from your employer, med board, hospital, insurance plan, and anyone else you don't trust 100%. And never, ever agree to mandatory mental health with preferred providers through your workplace or other medical institutions. If you want 100% confidential peer support, join us Sunday. As always, if you need to talk, I'm available. Free. No chart notes. Nothing to subpoena. If you're a psychiatrist listening to this, do let me know any other stealthy tips you use to keep docs safe in this crazy world of healthcare.